thank you all very much for coming. On behalf of the uh, trustees and the director of the Needham Institute and the Master and Fellows of Clare College, a very welcome to you all to this fourth Joseph Needham Memorial Lecture. Uh, we are very grateful to our sponsors on this occasion, the Gene Brandt Corporation, but also the support we have from various institutions around town, the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, Gondwell and Keyes College, the Department of History and Philosophy of Science, and the Department of Archaeology all conspired to support us to put on this event every year. It gives me particular pleasure to welcome this year Professor Dagmar Schaefer to deliver the lecture. Professor Schaefer is Director of the Department 3 Artifacts, Action and Knowledge at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. She also holds honorary appointments at the, uh, <coughs> uh, the Technical University in Berlin, at the Freie Universität, and she is a guest professor at Shanghai Jiaotong University in China. Her main research interest is in the history and sociology of technology in China, focusing on paradigms configuring the discourse on technological developments past and present. She has published widely on materiality, on the processes and structures that lead to varying knowledge systems and the changing role of artifacts, text, objects, spaces in the creation, the diffusion and the use of scientific and technological knowledge. Her current research focuses on the historical dynamics of concept formation, situations and experiences of action through which actors have explored, handled, and explained their physical, social, and individual worlds. Uh, among her many honors, I would like to flag up one that is her monograph uh, with the University of Chicago Press that came out in 2000. And 11, the crafting of the 10,000 things, which won the Pfizer Award for the History of Science Society and the Levinson Prize from the Association for Asian Studies. Professor Schaefer is not new to Cambridge. She is also not new to the UK, having served as chair at the University of a chair of Chinese at the University of Manchester. So we are particularly delighted to have her back with us here. Today's lecture is entitled The Science of Silk, or What Can China Contribute to the History of Science? Please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. Schaefer. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming today, and thank you very much for the wonderful introduction by Ruud Sturks. I am very honored and pleased to present to you today uh, our, with the Needham Lecture one of my new projects that is actually the second iteration of a big project on silk. And it began with Threads of Global Desires that I uh, co-authored with uh, two colleagues, Luca Molla and Giorgio Diriello, and which was a global history. And now in this period, I'm trying to look at silk both as a technology and a science. And I'm, taking, I'm bringing this today to you to make some rather strange claims about Chinese sciences. You may find them strange and ask some very big questions about the history of science and how to actually do it. Because like no other material, silk has come to signify Chinese culture. It may thus also come as no surprise that historians have highlighted in particular the continuity of such knowledge within Chinese fields and practices of knowing. The majority of written and material sources about silk before the 17th century, though, can be traced back to a period in which non-Chinese constituted the elite in this part of the world, Jurchen and Jin, Indian Mongols in particular. There are many other groups, but it takes a long time to all tell them apart. Exploring so the history or the sciences of the silk, why and how knowledge about the tree, the worm, and the fabric was made, I would like to explore the changing nature of knowing the role of empiricism, foreign actors, so what that means, I hope we can discuss, local knowledge, also what that means, I hope we can discuss, 
And the imperial power in the 13th and 14th century is Asian world, and probably also what an effect it had in the long durée on scientific and technological development in this era of the world. So with these big questions in mind, I want to begin with a very, very tiny quote. <coughs> Sun, it leaves, it, it, its leaves feed the silkworm. <coughs> Several kinds exist. Blossoming sun have small, thin leaves. Zhe, a type of sun with small, thick leaves used to raise silkworm. So reads an entry on the left page 25A in the section on trees at the end of chapter three entitled Local Products of the Local Gazetteer of Zhenjiang. Sang, the tree, also appears in another local gazetteer of China's north, a place called Dongming. Here we find Sang in two chapters, one in a land tax related one and to a second time in the chapter seven, the chronology of auspicious events and disasters, which describe insects eating all the mulberry leaves in Dongming County in the year 1301, and another harvest loss in 1314, this time due to frost. We have here then a tree and a disaster. They are not of the same category, nor are they of the same quality of information. But both identify, as I will argue in today's lecture, a certain style of local knowledge of and about nature and the nature of knowledge during Yuan dynastic rule. Appearing in a genre that is habitually translated into English as local gazetteer, so di fang zhe, the source by definition then also allows us to root the tree historically not only in time and with respect to political history, but also in space. As far as negative evidence goes, until at least 1315, we thus have to consider mulberry trees grew in China's northern district of Dongming. And I think... Let me say so. Oh. Here is a map uh, in northern district of Dongmi, which is here. Yeah. And in the fifth month of the Zhiyan rain, which is by the Gregorian calendar, the spring of 3030, Sang was also observed in Zhenjiang, located near modern Nanjing, so much further south in the larger geography of Yuan Mongolian empires that is now the region of, modern, of the modern People's Republic of China. So you see what I want today to talk about is about the dialectics of space, material and science that generated Chinese sciences as Chinese, beginning with how Sang, through positive and negative references, was generated as a localized of Orteter uh, would be the German word, fact by the 14th century, and how this very construction of Sang as a truth located somewhere has been reflected in our understanding of the historical development of knowledge expressed in China. I'm interested in the ways historical actors and historiography then gathered such information and which practices, bureaucratic and scholarly, provided such information later with value and credibility from the 1330s right up until today. But today I will really only talk about a very particular period in which I think the idea of what local knowledge was, was really defined in the genre of local gazetteer that is quite ubiquitous in Chinese history. So here is an example of a local gazetteer of which about 10,000 titles exist from roughly the 9th century up until the imperial reign in 1911. There are more afterwards, but uh, we stop, or I stop at this period with this research, that are, in the words of Peter Bowles, since the era uh, of the Song Dynasty, so of the 10th century, or 9th century, 9th, 10th century, 
a standard compendium of information about uh, administrative units under Chinese imperial rule, a prefecture, county, canton, or town, about its building infrastructures, natural and constructed landscapes, rivers, mountains, reservoirs, and so on and so on, its history and its taxes, to quote Anne. There are numerous studies about local gazetteers. Some very important one by Western scholars are Pierre Etienneville, Timothy Brook, Michael Brose, etc., etc. They all have emphasized their diversity of content, their complexity as text, but more than anything uh, else, as Joseph Dennett has argued, they have all emphasized that they are the richest and most abundant historical source and often the best source for local information. Over centuries, they have constituted, hence, the very sites where elites produced and negotiated what local knowledge was on which any of their theories or practices should be based. Sang is a particularly apt subject to illustrate, illustrate the historical dynamics of space and science and show why understanding these dynamics may be equal and relevant today for us. Because as the first quotes say, Sang first and foremost served in the 14th century as the main fodder for the domesticated caterpillar, habitually translated as silkworm Zhan. As such, Sang, which I will just so that you all understand me from now on uh, uh, translate as mulberry, but I really mean this Sang fodder, hence identifies a material, a resource, rather than a plant. A resource that classical Chinese literature and artifacts allows us to situate within the formative period of Chinese cultural history, and a resource upon which politicians and the public of China today also founded or wants to found their future identity. So what traces does such a uniquely exclusive and if you wish so also biased and long durée investment into a socio-material complex leave in a culture's understanding of nature, its scientific and technological development? And conversely, also, how does one anchor such knowledge not only imperially, but first and foremost, also locally in the people's minds and pe uh, people's activities today? How does one own it locally? And so here you see a map of wherever you can find a local monograph in China over this period. I will, I will just, I will clarify more on that there, but that's basically wherever you find a local monograph that mentions Sung in its history several times. So that's a big space that says something. I should begin with some disclaimers. Certainly, I am by far not the first one who is interested in the Chinese history of silk. And I would actually assume that even 20 years of lecturing here every day for 24 hours would not really suffice to summarize everything that has been written about it already. I will not do that, so forgive me if I forget to mention my very important research. <coughs> Such studies have, and that I would like to say, emphasized how elites over centuries produced this expert literature about the tree and the warm expanding from philosophical overviews into expert topics, or the state support, how the state supported the accumulation of information on such topics, how it worshipped and spread it, by ways of rituals, handbooks, generating even a specialist genre of agronomic text that science and civilization of China has uh, written uh, much about and published much about. And then there are side writings by the authors who contributed to this series, Francesca Bray, Dieter Kuhn, John Major, uh, Zhao Feng, and many, many others. <laughs> and yet, what I will quite confidently claim to today is that none of this research has hitherto tackled major issues that I will bring up today. The shifting relationships that make the tree a category of value and knowing a truth in one place, and another important class of disaster, for instance, in another space and text. How the occupation with this very spatial technique of producing cloth affected approaches to life and death. How ideas about future past evidence about a very particular moment in which knowledge about silk was newly defined 
and concerns about silk changed in the 13th to 14th century, about what actually knowledge was, how it needed to be generated and preserved or required new framings and the dismissal of long-term ideas. So as I said, at the background of my inquiry still stands a larger concern of which the history of silk is an exemplary case too, namely the way in which our understanding of epistemic ruptures and continuities in scientific technological development still hinges on either modernist assumptions such as the importance of the machine or China's own political historiography too. So that it was, for instance, the Song promoting silk and the Yun exploiting it and thus not being so important to all these sciences and techniques, and that the Ming returned to Song traditions too. Some of the particularities of Song production that, in my view, have to make us rethink the Yun's role as an interim or its effect as interrupter, interrupter or continuity within Chinese knowledge culture, I would like to propose today, although I would say there is still much to research that um, I cannot all bring up in this uh, one lecture of 50 minutes. But I, there are some things that I would likely want to address that makes the Yuan dynasty quite important. So here once again, just so that you remember where the places are, and then certainly my very interest in materiality here flecked with one tea ball of the Song dynasty, where you see how the, the tree or the leaf very much is in the presence of the Chinese mind. So this is before the period I'm talking about where the Sang, the mulberry tree is an art piece, is a philosophical piece. And all I'm saying now afterwards is a, an argument to say like that changed after the Yuan dynasty. So these are the questions I would like to discuss today. Where is Sang and where is silk? How was Sang known and pr produced? And what is localized? And I've given you in white here the questions that I think are related to the Yuan dynasty. So did the Yuan dynasty continue or destroy? What did the foreign actors, familiar practices, and probably disasters too, to the culture of silk? And was the yuan producing silks, textiles, or a unified space? This has to do a lot with the discussions on cotton and capitalism that are held in, in global debates. I will go to all these issues step by step. It, I know it's a lot to manage, but I hope I can get you step by step into this discussion. And in the third point, I want to go back to the question, what is localized, verortetes wissen, a localized knowledge? and want to say a little bit about silk reeling and technologies of matters and the mind. For all I say today, we are only talking about a couple of years, namely between the years 1296 to 1315, when both Dongmin and Zhenjiang were under the rule of the dynastic house of the Yuan dynasty, that itself was part of the rule of the Pax Mongolica. Oops, I've given you the big picture, and here I'm giving you the Yuan dynasty as such. So this is the whole Pax Mongolica, and this is the Yuan dynasty. The two uh, emperors are Chengzong Emperor or Elzhi Jitu or Kuluk Khan and the um, uh, Buyatun Khan who have basically ruled China in this era. They are all a little bit different uh, and we can also discuss the differences there but it's this period that interests me most mainly because in this period we see a huge upsurge of literature that uh, we, are, our historians of science and technology, are very interested in. Not always because it was produced in this era, but because it was published and maintained and continued during this period. So I give you here some examples on uh, uh, mathematical primers that give us important insights or the geography of the empire, a lot of uh, materia medica literature, that in this period either claimed to have retrieved some Song dynasty ideal or like done it probably also differently. Very often we can't say that because we don't know uh, 
what the previous versions were. So the extant versions are of the Yuan dynasty. And I've chosen the years of my research to really look at this kind of literature. We know that by this period, astronomical knowledge seeping in from India and the Near and Central East features highly in the awareness of, his, of historians of science, producing something that Nathan Sivin has suggested, the most precise calendar in Chinese history in 1281 under the reign of Kublai Khan. Less well known is that engineering agronomy were equally high on the agenda of Kublai and all those three emperors and his successors too. So I said the Materia Medica, the, the genres are a little bit different. Then there is this whole agronomical literature about you will, which you will hear very much, published in the year 1273, for instance, um, uh, 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 an imperial commission compendium or Wang Cheng's agronomical book in 1313. Why do I say this has not been paid attention to? You could go to Science and Civilization and actually see that this, these books have been dealt with. I say they have not been dealt with because despite the actually really clear dating in the Yuan dynasty, historians of science and technology and most other historians too, habitually situate all these works into this Chinese Song Ming tradition. So Billy Ki Lung Se, Hans Ulrich Vogel, Francesca Bray, all of them say Song dynasty rather than the Jurch and Jin, rather than the Liao dynasty, rather than all the, the authors that we don't know of from which these people are gathered, but which truly probably lived more in the north than they lived in the south, as the contents of these works are saying. A couple of other smaller works need also to be named here that this kind of literature usually doesn't pay much attention to because it doesn't have so much new stuff, so much invention or innovation in it. And I think that's probably should be reconsidered too. Um, I, will, I will come to that in a second. We can even understand these publications as part of a government campaign to foster and enforce silk production all across the imperial territory, as recent excavations have shown us, because they were all excavated in this Gansu corridor, so showing us that all the policies that we read in the centers were actually also promoted to very far places, producing something that as Thomas Elson has said uh, in a very, very important book, uh, the riches of the Mongol Empire, riches that he describes as having like, been uh, stimulated in substantial parts from the outside rather than within. And there is another new work that is very interesting by Juliane von Fuchs, with, who has basically gone around in Europe and has looked at all the silks of this period, in particular these 50 to 70 years, and looked at the material artifacts that you find in European churches that tell you about the Mongolian Empire and how rich it actually was. And I'm giving you here just an example of one of the German churches, because that's where I come from. <laughs> But you see, they are coming all of the holy empire of the medieval period. So just briefly, these recently excavated official local ro uh, reports, mostly coming out of uh, rather, so let's say, normal middle class official people, confirm a large scale government campaign that systematically urged local officials to disseminate information about the tree, the worm, the practices you need to know, everything you need to know what, uh, how, in order to make silk. Local administrators, of whom the compiler of the Zhenjiang local gazetteer, Yu Shilu, is a prime example and representative, for instance, emphasized also, and that may not surprise, agricultural production, taxes of mulberry leaves and silk products, and meticulously reported on household numbers, land usages, and rules. So he's the originator of the quote that we saw in the beginning. He and another wise unknown but identifiable Uyghur named Tuo Yu or Toktor, 
When asked to compile a guidance report for all, so that's what local gazetteers were written for other local officials, so that's the audience of uh, these local gazetteers, he, he compiled a guidance report following the stylistic rules of an earlier Song dynastic gazetteer. And according to these rules, which he describes in the prefaces and some of the postfaces, he used three different sources in order to compile the local gazetteer. So the Zhenjiang local gazetteer has literary Chinese sources of prior periods about geographic and ad administrative issues. It uses tax records. On the third observation, we have no real evidence. There is information we cannot trace back to other things, but it's also the case that Yu Xilu, who lived in Zhenjiang, could have used observation for it, just that he doesn't mark it in the local gazetteer as such. He is, in contrast to the rich culture of publication that I was like uh, explaining to us existed by that time, we have multiple publications, especially of the agronomical books or the Materia Medica. He didn't use any of these sources, even though he could have. There are no Materia Medica references in his books. There is no agronomy literature, even in the slightest, in his books. And there is no private writing used, which is also in Yuan dynastic, uh, uh, literati were obsessed with the mulberry tree. I can tell you there is so much they could have referenced, but they didn't. Yeah. So Yi Xin Lu did not quote from a Chinese literature that was available to him. I, I may not have mentioned it, but it was on the slide. Yi Xin Lu was very well known as a Chinese writer, so he compiled a lot of calligraphy, but he has a mixed background, whatever it is, yeah? which people say based on his language analysis, so how he uses grammar. So I think that Yu found it important to mention in the local gazetteer that he was writing, a mulberry is worth a moment of our attention when comparing his gazetteer to that of Dong Ming, which does not contain any entry on mulberry tree leaves as cash crop, although it becomes quite interesting. We know that by 1300, mulberry trees and sericulture production was much more present, ubiquitous, and familiar in this region than in Zhenjiang, where Yixilu lived. There was nothing like that was really substantially good by that period, known about that period. So before I go into this conundrum, let me say some other things about um, Dongming. So according to the official dynastic history of the Yuan dynasty, Dongming had to deliver a substantial tax of sericulture. So uh, raw silk, more than 1,146 liang. This is basically at the upper end of what, the, what uh, sericulture producing regions, um, higher end, what they had to deliver. And also a considerable number of woven cloth. So if we look at the, com like the comparable information that we can find from other local gazetteers that exist during the Yuan dynasty, Throughout, this is, these are all that basically come up during the Yuan dynasty and have original uh, material of this era. So we look at this era and how they are talking about sericulture, we find some very interesting patterns. Namely, and that's my explanation why Yu wanted to mention mulberry trees as a personal interest, uh, not as more than just a tax, it's because all these places that have the mulberry tree mentioned in these things do have a problem with mulberry trees. So either there exists no sericulture there or it has to be implemented. So let us compare the two places a little bit further. So by, uh, by 1300, Sichuan, northern Hebei, Hefei, and Shandong provinces were these major producing centers for silk, whereas Jiangnan and Zhili, so the places, here you see Zhenjiang, where this is uh, where, where Yu Xilu was living, 
had to invest into sericulture because the Yuan Dynasty court wanted to expand silk production. I should also mention or bring back to your attention that the origin of the information on Dongming is much less clear than that of Zhen Ming, because the earliest known version compiled by Chen Liu and Gao Xiang in the year 1536 is according to an old preface very much based on local material, as they say, but it could only be compiled 500, uh, sorry, 300 years, uh, no, 150 years later. So much was edited, but then not published because of warfare in the Sung Yan period, because the local gentry didn't pay enough attention to it, and because the place had multiple problems with, um, uh, with the government too. So finally, when the work came into, um, into publication, Dongming was at a situation when the, produce, or the, producing eras, or the producing areas of silk had changed already. So when Dongming was, the local gazetteer was actually produced, lots of the silk production had already been established in the South. I should probably also mention that while not all um, while, uh, local gazetteers are in fact quite different, both of these local gazetteers have a similar arrangement and I will give you some insights into that. So all of them have a disaster record, which basically means they have a, a, a historical overview of very, e very simple records of when a disaster occurred at this place. Zhenjiang itself is of 1300, so it only has the disasters of the previous periods because that's, uh, they, no dynasty wants to emphasize that it has disasters because it is a threat to legitimacy, so of, to the legitimacy of the rule because of the mandate of heaven. So we find these records in both, but naturally in Zhenjiang none of the Yuan dynasty, but we could find them in the next local gazetteer because every local gazetteer is constantly reproduced. So, compiled by 1513-6, there is no such historical data. Where does the historical data actually come from? We know that Dong Ming in 1536 has a different idea about how to compile such information. So uh, in the preface, uh, Gao Xiang says that he wants to have a principle of heaven, earth, and humans, and then actually explain all that is present in this day. This principle is actually a little bit different to what Zhen Jiang, so what Yi Xi Lun did, because he's emphasizing Texas agriculture and the demography of Zhen Jiang, even though he's also explaining that he's following the same principle. So he has a similar organizing principle in mind, or at least claims that, but does something slightly different. I'll now show you a very difficult graph, but it's a very exciting one for, <laughs> for those uh, who know about local gazetteers a little bit more. So you imagine this very long delay period of ever reproducing local gazetteers with the same information, all with an idea about how to classify and structure knowledge. So how, I want to say the heck, how the heck did the editors actually decide where, when to use which classification scheme and how do we understand that when we look at it from, from a, a historical perspective. So we made a very complicated graph of that, identifying the different uh, regulations that the local gazetteers follow, so which style of classification, cosmological principle, etc., they are following and where they were produced, when, and if this principle was followed, and if it actually um, is similar to what is actually happening in the local gazetteer. And then you find clusters, and these clusters follow social networks, which is not surprising, but they also follow throughout time and space certain patterns of what you can actually do. And you find clusters like, for instance, that the local gazetteers in Shanxi and the local gazetteers in Sichuan, so this is red, this is um, purple, or whoever you want to call it, are actually very similar. Yeah? They have a very similar way of, of classifying information. 
Or you can also find information that those of Shanxi basically always have like household taxes in them, whereas those of Guangdong have that not in them. So you can compare them in relation to each other and then see who follows which principle and who has which ideas in mind, and then find really new revelations about the social networks and the intellectual networks that fed into this culture. So a bit complicated, it's a lot of social network analysis, and you can say you can also look at the family themselves, but you can't because only then you can find that actually a local gazetteer in Gansu has a similar content organization than a local gazetteer, for instance, in Zhenjiang. So to our local gazetteers, we can, for instance, see that Yu Shilun, who produced his local gazetteer in 1300, and the Dongming disaster record that is here, that their sources of information are very different. I'm just skipping here a little bit to give you an idea about how that is. So, in the local gazetteer of Zhengjiang, we have a process in which an individual looks at the, at the situation at his place, produces knowledge and information, puts it in the local gazetteer, and it moves up to the it, and it moves from the state down to the local gazetteers and remains there. In the case of the Dongming local gazetteer, whether or not the information was locally retrieved or not, what we can actually say is that in this case, the idea, for instance, of a disaster related to Mulberry does not come from the local place, but it comes a hundred years later from the Ming Dynasty state back into the local gazetteers and then is localized there. And we can say that because we can follow the information in the local gazetteers. So where was it written first and where does it appear afterwards and is it the same one? So in the Dongming local gazetteer, we find that uh, Sang, a contemporary fact is extant, but not reported in the local gazetteer. But disasters are created as a fact after the fact. Yes, so they are created as a historical fact that remains a historical fact. And in the Zhengjing local gazetteers, there is a contemporary plan or a vision that there should be mulberry trees because you have to inform people what it's actually for, as the quote says, and a historical obligation entrusted to all other editions of the local gazetteers. So the interesting thing now is that you have to think of an, every quote of a song in that chapter where it's about the taxonomy of plants, that this actually means probably there was no mulberry tree, rather than, as historians have thought, that this is a confirmation that mulberry trees were actually at this place. So in a fast forward, it then looks like this. So if you begin with like the, the ninth century, you see how the, the sang appears in the taxonomy chapters of the local gazetteers, and you see that it always appears where actually there is no sericulture production which is quite an interesting thing to see, like how knowledge is produced at the place that doesn't yet know about the actual fact. So, the last part is actually the, the Ming and Qing dynasty. So there you see that like taxonomy also turns into a really interesting issue. So, and you can actually, from our database, you can click in every uh, detailed local gazetteer to see where it's actually emerging. But enough of that. I know that's a lot of technical playing around, but it shows you that like social network analysis can do something with materials too. So now we've seen that there is a text give us a construction of reality, a plan, like a, probably a reflection of a historical fact, but very often they gave us a, give us a plan about what should be rather than what is. I'm coming to my second question about like how was Sang silk known and produced? So the actors and localities of the Yuan dynasty of these 40 or 50 period, uh, years period. So we see in this period, texts play a very important role. Otherwise, the government wouldn't have published so many. But we also know from these texts that local knowledge gathering and information plays an important role because the Yuan dynasty really wants to have that silk. 
Uh, we see the economical tax and the imperially commissioned tax that the historians of science have talked so much about. But we see also these locally owned texts by people like Lu Ming Shan, again, somebody who is actually not of um, um, a Chinese origin. Lu Ming Shan is actually well known, and he's not very well known. So Lu Ming Shan was the son of Karuna Dasa, and that is a generation of Pai or even multilingual writers. Somebody who studied him very well is, a, a, let's say, a former German colleague of mine, Herbert Franke, who considers him a Chinese because he has a Chinese name. But Lu was definitely of a background that we would call Hui or Uyghur. And he was, as, uh, as uh, uh, some newly found archival records say, he was obviously also very interested in these cultures. We can even assume that he did grow up with a very multiple, like uh, multilingual society and that Chinese was only one of his mother tongue. In the generation of Karuna Daza, so the people who taught Lu Mingshan, we find, for instance, Nao Nao and An Zhang, as well as Bilan Shile, all of them are well-known people who know Mongolian, Tibetan, and Sanskrit, and who were very much involved into the writing campaign. In Lu Mingshan's Nungshan Jiao, what we actually see is a multiplicity of languages that Sinologists for a long time have decided to call bad Chinese. So in, in particular, our colleagues in China, so Shang Yanding and an, another couple of people, analyzed the stele inscriptions and local sources on Lu Ming Shang, because Lu Ming Shang has no official biography in the Yuan Dynasty. And uh, it's also because the sources are really very difficult to find for, in particular, these, this period. And an important researcher of his multilingualism, Professor Yang Lian Tseng, for instance, has also shown how the different languages actually worked into that. And it's quite interesting to see that our local gazetteers, written by people such as Yi Xie Lun, show very similar patterns. So we see here a language expertise also substantially influenced by what you would call non literati born non-Chinese people living in Asia. I can show you some more of these people. So Yushilon is one, the compiler of the local gazetteers. Another very important person to Silk, I think, is Ma Duanlin. And Ma Duanlin, Ma is an indicator that he also is uh, of a non-Chinese origin. He compiled an imperial archival compendium, the Wenxian uh, Tongkao. And in this compendium that really bases on archival record, what you find is which place delivers which kind of taxes. And so he is one of the persons who also knew where you could actually find silk taxes and that people like Yu Xilun, I found out, were connected to, but that people like Lu Mingchang may have well come across during their, um, uh, during their work. Uh, Lu Ming Shan's work is represented in major catalogs of the Ming dynasty. So under all these different names, that's probably also why nobody has really paid attention to him. It has very different names. And up until the end of the Ming dynasty, major bibliophiles wanted to have that book in their library. And he writes very important things. For instance, one of the major techniques that allowed people at that period to uh, graft trees and cultivate them in areas where they were formerly not grown. So the grafting of the trees and how you actually do it and when you do it is to be found there. And with a colleague of mine who did a lot of help for me, we found that, the, in fact, even the framing of the mark is very similar to what you find in the Filhala literature of the Near East. This all appears against a background of imperially commissioned works that are well known. So this is, for instance, uh, what Rosalind Hammers has uh, uh, 
pointed out in the pictures of Tilling and Wheeling, the whole Song Dynasty literature, the image campaigns that talk about centrally sponsored sericulture. And she's definitely right to point out that in the philosophy of the Song Dynasty, all these issues were very important. This is a Yuan copy, and what I wanted to draw your attention to, I will not elaborate on this, is that very interesting, when we look at it, at the transition of sericulture knowledge from the Song to the Ming Dynasty, as Francesca Bray has argued, we see a gender change from man to women of a lot of the sericulture tasks, including the picking of the, of the leaves. But in the Yuan copies, we usually see men doing this. Yeah? So things that we also have not really considered, how, where does this change of gender in expertise come from, and which role does the Yuan dynasty actually play? Same here, you see in very substantial Yuan copies, you'd see men rather than women uh, doing major tasks. I want to finalize in the last next 10 minutes that I have with a little bit a, li a different topic, but that also brings up this question of localized, though with a slightly more probably history of technology focus. This is about the reeling machines. Why are the reeling machines so important? First, the reeling machines are the thing that the historians of science have emphasized most has changed in this period. And that is because you had two different reeling machines, one in the north and one in the south. So one different to those. In these reeling machines, the important issue is, as Wang Zhen describes in his book, that you use a machine that allows you to produce quickly with two people side by side. So this is his setup and he shows like two setups that were probably operated by two people. There are other images where you can actually see the two people but they are from a later age so I didn't put them in. When you look at the literature and the, the records on reeling machines in that very period and I've done uh, quite a lot of work on that, on rereading them, then you can find very interestingly that maybe what this era was really interested about had nothing to do with labor efficiency. Because in contrast to a modern interest in mechanics, 14th century authors focused on two different issues when it comes to the description of the reeling process. First, Wang Zhong, like Lu Mingxiang, like all those other and many contemporary authors of the Yuan dynasty, seem to concur that the success of reeling depended largely on the appropriate breeding of the warm. And second, that water and heat, rather than mechanics and consequent issues of velocity and strength, were the focus of the instrument and tool development. Wang Jun, for instance, begins to elucidate the limits of human work and its implement, notifying, and I think I have this quote, that the neck or the secret of successfully reeling off a thin, round, even and tight silk thread began with the creation of the cocoon. It is like the human hand is too late or too inferior to solve that problem. Sleeping problems, moist and temperature, all could, as one note, affect the filament's brightness and its length. All the compilations emphasize that if you really want to understand a cocoon, uh, how to produce silk, you have to begin by studying the cocoon in relation to what it actually is. And you have to define the technologies in relation to what you achieve. If you look at this theory and then you look at the idea of what a reeling machine actually divided into northern and southern did by this period, then I would argue you could say something about the way in which you organize silk production, not locally, but imperially. And if you know that in the north there is the, the raw material produced, but in the south you still have to cultivate the silk, you have to think about labor division. And you have to provide a machine that allows you to divide that labor in a way that you can, like, on the one hand, raise the cocoons and then reel the silk 
And in between, there is the step that you need to kill the worm so that the worm doesn't come out. And this is exactly what this machine does if you look at what Wang Zhen and those guys are interested in. It tries to think about the labor processes of how actually you can uh, process the cocoon and reel it. And, and even though the worm had to be or was killed in a, in a, in a uh, earlier period, and so you could, for instance, reel it at another place, or you could reel it uh, even months after the harvest. So when you look at the machine of silk reeling from that point of view, then you see that the northern and the southern definition exactly solve that problem. They allow you to divide the labor in new ways. They allow you to reel the silk at the point in time when you have no, uh, when you when you have time and well, independent of where you actually have produced the silk. So where does this all leave us? And you see, I'm skipping a little bit. So if we look at science and civilization in China and all the questions that were answered by this wonderful compilation about the changing knowledge of technology and science about silk, then we see what was major to that work is to see that China was a space against the rest. But what we see here is diversity. This can certainly be explained in many ways, not only because of the times when these, with these issues were compiled, when they were written about, was just the time when you wanted to do such a thing. But I think now we can see with the better access to the archival sources, but also to the sources we already have and the new methods that we are using, that there is a diversity that we need to explain and that we also need to explain what it actually means that knowledge is local in China or probably Chinese in different periods, in different places, and in different instances. I was talking about the silk reeling machine and I was talking all about silk. In the history of technology, we also have to learn something. When we look at silk production in the Yuan dynasty, then we always do exclusively look at how it's actually expanding, irrespective of asking what the Yuan dynasty was actually talking about. We see silk as the elitist, as the cultural carrier in that rule, and cotton as the capital influx that is actually coming. I think, based on my research, even though I cannot go into that, we also have to reconsider that, considering how these territories need to be reconfigured when we reassess our sources. If we look at China, as it was described in Science and Civilization, you have a northern era that is full of fells. You have um, like a place in Sichuan and probably here around Dongming, where silk is produced. And then you have the south, basically with bust and fibers. That's what my doctor father, Dieter Kuhn, was very interested in and wrote fabulous stuff about. And we have a little bit of cotton here. So when you think about the histories of capitalism that are written now, then you hear all of them talking about cotton rather than silk. And that cotton seeps in into China too. But it does something entirely different than it does, for instance, in India or in the British case. So you still have the northern region of felt, but according to the local gazetteers, what you then have, and you also still have the plants in here, but what you have is an expanding area of silk, and you have an expanding area of cotton too. So two fibers produced at the same place and very often really discussed together rather than apart. So it's not silk and cotton technology, but it's textiles that they are talking about. In our modern understanding, and that's the point I would like to finish with, Local knowledge has been naturalized as the most exclusive partner to the historical emergence of sciences. Local knowledge as anthropology understands it and as it comes out of a European tradition of analyzing it. 
And with the emergence of science, I probably here mean more for the sake of brevity, both pre-modern and modernized standards of standardized bodies of systematic truth standards, that is knowledge which is nowhere in particular and anywhere at all, or to say it more philosophically, which is the significance of the place is dissolved. The debates on the dialectics of science and place is an old one, so identifiable in the history of science students, Prodel, Bourdieu, and many others. And these discussions have led to important insights, but as Dermot Finnegan noted, they have also highlighted the indelible mark left by different social and cultural milieus on the making and marketing of scientific claims. And he continues the strong program symmetry postulate that any explanation of competing scientific claims should bracket a concern with ontological truth and ask the same sociological questions of local accounts of scientific credibility has provided grounds to undermine automatic denigration of contextualization and scrutinize rather than assume disembodied or placeless characters of scientific rationality, which is actually a reference to David Bloor. So this has led to numerous studies highlighting the political character of any definition of knowledge as either local or science in various new pairings, so such as Kapil Raj, Jürgen Re Kapil Raj's book on colonial and post-colonial debate, Jürgen Renn's book on global and local, and James Segor's book on notions of sciences as forms of local knowledge and global sciences, and so on. All these studies are really very important, but their emphasis on the local, the modernity project, and the structures of power that's afforded have really been significant. But interestingly, they have basically never looked at what a culture really does when it defines culture as locally and not, and how it does that in very particular way. So if you ask me what the Chinese body that, of literature that we have, its materials can actually do, what it can contribute to the history of science, here is another historical model of how actors in the short and in the long durée constructed and made knowledge local, how they applied it purposefully to create facts. Is this peculiar to China? I don't know, we may probably ask Wu Hui in two weeks when she's comparing a similar kind of literature in the Spanish Empire. But I would say that the history of the mulberry trees not only embodies the political implications of the many different levels, so the dialectics between science and place and its history in China particularly well, I would also say that it has an important story to tell today when the sciences give us more and more data about such instances too. So archaeobotanists and most historians too would attempt to escape from the blurriness that these textual records seem to offer by accepting that Sang as a plant largely corresponds to Carl von Linné's idea of what he termed in 1753 as Morus Alba, of which you see a dissemination chapter, uh, dissemination map here. I have not used this term today, although it is really tempting to point to Mori culture as an organic metaphor for a process of selecting, pruning and adapting the plant's life, and thus a technology that transformed mulberry trees into a raw material and commodities subservient to an affluent industry of silk, an ecological system that, as Edmund Russell has noted, over centuries, if not millennia, made plants and animals work for people, and people work for plants and animals. I did not do so because, alas, in the Chinese literature up until the 19th century, no such term exists but rather terms identify important technical socio-cultural symbiosis. The plant with the animal, the animal with reeling, reeling with the animal and weaving, and so on and so on. As a history about the hegemony of science, we can see Linnaeus disciples travel to China and take stock of the plant as botany, as you actually see. But as a history, of what actually happened in the Yuan dynasty, we can see that the sang, the material, was a different local knowledge altogether too. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
you very much, Dagmar. Uh, we, we have some time for comments <coughs> and for questions. Do you think the UN was a blip? The mm -hmm. situation in the UN was basically sort of an exception in that, you know, we have politically, you know, an empire where obviously you know, everything is paired up, you know, mm -hmm. local elites are paired up with, mm -hmm. you know, non-Chinese elites, the pressures perhaps mm -hmm. to, to, to depict something as local mm -hmm. may have been different, let's say, from either during the Song or later in the Ming period. Mm -hmm. Because what's fascinating, what you're saying is, is, is on the one hand, you have this movement of presenting knowledge as local, even you know when there is no local knowledge there. And on the other hand, of course, in, in, in the literature that you showed, you know, this is the imperially commissioned mm -hmm. uh, compendia, you've got an attempt, of course, to universalize mm -hmm. local knowledge into something that has to be presented as, as, as part of the grand enterprise of the Tianxia. So do you have a sense that Mm -hmm. A, both Silk and B, the Yuan Dynasty, you know, are a particular moment in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would actually really say it is a particular moment in time with very lasting consequences. And I think that's what we really have to understand. And I think the local gazetteers that I showed, I think I have to go to the beginning to show you that. That's why I put in this very, I know it's not a very, uh, it's not a very easy draft, but it shows it shows you a very important, I think, think about how to understand the, the, the enormous power that a genre such as the local gazetteers actually has. If you see this map, I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to study local gazetteers is because everybody in the discipline of China really needs them, even if only like kind of referencing them as like, this is the place Suzhou in 1325 and it had a local gazetteer and according to the local gazetteer, this is what it looked like. Or even this local gazetteer says that in the Han Dynasty in the third century, that's what the place actually had, if it had disasters yet. So kind of like really a local history. But if you look at this map, what you actually see in relation to what we know about Sari culture is that because uh, people knew by the Ming dynasty, by the 15th century, that this genre exists, they, gave an, they have an, an, an idea about what kind of knowledge is at a place, but also that there is a large body of knowledge around them that they could consult equally. And then they decide that this is a fact, what is written in that and that they want it to be written down as a fact that constitutes what the place actually is. What Peter Bowl did in a very nice study, I think it was published in 2001 or something, emphasized this, this Ming dynasty shift to local knowledge and local identity made this place a reality in the book. And then the reality in the book became a plan for what the place should be. And then whenever you had written there as a local gazetteer of Zhenjiang that you should have sung there. You can read in the, in the private literature, you can read in, 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 in science literature, these places had mulberry trees in the third century because it's written in the local gazetteers, right? So you have a, a cross generation of what actually a fact is. Also because in certainly in some periods, bookish knowledge was more important than anything else, right? So you see, you see these dynamics, you can now reveal at the, as you said, at really very quickly from, from this information to understand what is really going on and why a dynastic author, for instance, could say, in all these regions we have sung because he knew he could go to the local gazetteer and there it was written. And that was a fact for him. Yeah. Not what probably grew on the ground. Yeah. And that made me think about this idea of where do you gather scientific facts? How do you deal with the credibility of it? And what, what kind of effect does that have on the literature? And did we really look thoroughly into that in the agronomy literature? That is usually discussed as cumulative, not as in relation to its own time period. Oh, thank you very much, Dagmar. This is really fantastic. Um, really learned a lot, lot of things. <coughs> Sorry. Um, the question I wanted to ask you is, uh, uh, let's say a termino terminological one. So mm. I'm, I'm intrigued by the, uh, the way uh, the word science appeared 
in, in the talk. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you asked the question in the title, what, does China, what can China contribute to the history of science? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, um, much of the content you discussed would um, belong to what we usually define as technology and reading machines and so on. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder what is your take on this mm -hmm. distinction between science and technology, or do you think we should just get rid of that dichotomy and just talk about knowledge? <laughs> That's a very, uh, that I cannot answer that in, in, um, in full, but let me put it that way. A, when I'm using science, I'm using deliberately not knowledge. Yeah? Although I think, and that's totally, I'm totally in favor of what Francesca Bray wrote about the difference between science, technology, and techniques, and that it's very useful to use that as an analytic, so one should not dismiss it. But very often I use science as knowledge as an umbrella term. I do not use knowledge very often because I think the question of or like or this distinction may lead to ideological issues that I'm not willing to consent to that also I would say stand very much in the tradition of Joseph Needham that uh, have to do with the fact that if you want to understand science, you always have to understand what knowledge is, but not all knowledge is science, and what I'm really interested in is the sciences. Yeah? So that is why I usually, I, I would say, I said a lot about information and knowledge generation, but my heuristic interest is in the sciences. <coughs> It's not in all the kinds of knowledges that were produced, but you have to know it, otherwise you can't understand what kind of sciences come out. That would be the short answer to it. Thank you. Uh, this is really just a question of ignorance because I, I don't have the background. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I mean, where the knowledge of sericulture originated and as you show something of an explosion in this 13th century period, who exactly was promoting the business of sericulture, for what reason and by what method? Mm -hmm. uh, I think knowing that bit of background would help me mm -hmm. place a lot of what you are discussing in context. A very important question. Yeah, I think if, you, if we look at the documents that we are having, I, I uh, hinted at it, it's really the government, so the Yuan Dynasty Mongol empires who wanted to have silk, and the people who were basically concerned with knowledge gathering were all the local officials, whoever they were, or everybody who, who could read and write. But we have, especially in the Yuan uh, private writings, we have a lot of reference to how literati uh, who were not very well liked by the Yuan dynasty government, how they were sent out to consult farmers, how well farmers were asked to come to the markets, that chants had to be collected, all that kind of things that you would, would consider local knowledge in order to produce silk. But you also have to consider that all those people who want, or like the emperors who wanted to produce silk really didn't know anything about it. And for those local officials, it was the best way to be being promoted when they wrote about sericulture, when they wrote about the mulberry tree. That was also a way to maintain their position. I just think when you look at it and the extent to which this, this, these two different groups, so those people who are Chin probably Chinese, let me put according to the name, probably Chinese, and being very much into the Chinese traditions of Confucianism and Song Dynasty, how they describe silk by that period and this kind of knowledge generation in comparison to this other group that I tried to, to describe that comes from the outside, also serves the Mongol ruler, but at least has its identity anchored also in non-Chinese traditions like Ma Duanlin, like Yu Xilun or the like they really have a different understanding of what local knowledge is and how they are using these sources. And that's a very subtle history that I think really needs a little bit more attention by us. Hi Dagmar, thank you very much for that. Um, very, very interesting. And I think um, 
you know, there's, a, there's um, a, another aspect to, to the process that's going on here. Am I right in understanding that, you know, the, the wonderful timeline map that you show, that's a map of ignorance. Yes. It's a map of people not knowing about... Yeah, so, I think I mean, that sinologists don't like me for that. So if you say that, <laughs> that what you find in the local gazetteers is not the fact, it's, it's, it's really difficult for us, yeah. But it, it's, it's super cool because it makes me think that, in fact, partly this is a story about um, the spread of realizing that one doesn't know something about something that is out there to be known. Yes. Um, which kind of puts a different slant on how we approach this. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I was, I was thinking if this is really a map of kind of multiplication of ignorance, um, is there anything to be said, and it may not be possible with the kinds of sources that you're working with, about the other... Uh, focus of attention on the question of credibility here, which is the credibility mm -hmm. of the go-betweens, of the intermediaries. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because you have a map that shows, as it were, geographical spread, um, do you have anything at all that can be said about who's taking this ignorance from place to place um, mm. and how people are trusted as the suppliers of ignorance rather than information? That's a very good question. I would love to answer that, but I'm not sure if I actually can. I'll try to explore into these things from more from the perspective of if you are a person living in these 50 years and you are not from China, how would you actually know where silk is? Yeah, and that's why I brought Ma Duan Lin in. So those guys who sit at the central government and go through the tax records of the previous dynasties and uh, of the Song dynasty that has collected all that stuff from elsewhere. And then you generate a map based on that or the encyclopedia that exists of this time. And if you take that map, then you really think all over China you can produce silk which is totally not true by that time. It's totally not possible by that time. But that is certainly, as you say, that would be an interlocutor who would have at least told the emperor, Kublai Khan, go ahead, you can produce silk everywhere in China. Yeah? So go ahead, do that, invest the money into that. Yeah? The other question of, I mean, A, this history is really quite long, and I think we really need to understand more carefully when these ruptures in fact-making are deliberate or not. I was briefly mentioning these Yuan dynastic disasters that the modern scientists, the climatologists, like so much. So uh, the local gazetteers are one of the major historical sources that scientists match with uh, uh, to see like when were local disasters and how did these things actually emerge. And as, I t as you saw, there's a little bit a more complicated story about it. And, but I've taken also here the Sang, so the Mulberry disaster, as a fact, rather than as uh, probably a construction of it. But this fact comes from the dynastic record. So it's a fact that is basically coming out of an imperial policy of financial compensation that has been granted, and hence the disaster was recognized as a disaster. Interesting is the story that like scientists nowadays, since the 20th century, climatologists, since Jukujun in China, take these particular mulberry disasters as a way to also define where they are going to search for disaster records, for rainfall, for these kind of things. So there is a whole story to be told how the story continues with the historicity, with the fact creation that is done by these local gazetteers. And there you can, there you can really tell some quite interesting stories about credibility and ignorance too. Thank you very much. Um, it's exactly on ignorance and disaster <laughs> that I want to ask you. Um, disaster in English is, as, is an astrological term. Yes. Um, bad China, stars, yeah, in China and I imagine in Chinese as well. No, in China it's a, a, a dis, it is like there is there are lots of things, but the, the generic term for disasters that you find is basically a fire, a big fire. Yeah. Oh, that's even better. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that prompts the question. Mm -hmm. um, you've explained extremely clearly to us, and obviously as citizens of the current government, we are very familiar with the idea that only under previous regimes yeah. does anything bad ever happen. Yeah. We know that. <laughs> um, 
what I would like more information on is therefore the etiology, the account mm -hmm. of disaster, mm -hmm. since that must have been an occasion on which rather sophisticated yeah. causal knowledge, yeah. something rather close to science, yeah. even for people like me who are extremely sceptical about the use of the word science for anything that yeah. you've talked about this evening. Yes. Um, <laughs> on, on that occasion, one might indeed have something that rather resembles a scientific mm -hmm. account for two reasons, to be very brief. One Emma has already raised, yeah. which is that A, yeah. market value depends not on knowledge but on ignorance. Yes. Mm -hmm. You do not know how this commodity is made. That is why you're going to pay <laughs> more for it. B, um, you're very likely, if you're an official, mm -hmm to need to give a highly naturalistic account mm -hmm. of misfortune. Yeah. Because if you do not, mm -hmm. it's a social account of yeah. misfortune. Yes. The boundary between the social and the natural is an entirely bureaucratic boundary. Exactly. I imagine that's the case in the dynasty that you're talking about. So that must press on the category of what shall we call it expiatory knowledge. Yes, exactly. That is being produced in these retrospective disaster stories. Yes, and it is really very interesting. We did, we did thank you so much. This is really, uh, I'll just say something else about it. I didn't go into the disaster issue today because it was always already uh, quite a lot. But if you go into the, the local gazetteers disaster records, and I showed you the one of Dung Ming with the very, very annual one, you can actually see that there are different kinds of mulberry harvest disasters. Some of them say like the leaves were all eaten by some insects. Others say basically the mulberry seedling was destroyed by frost or there was wind or whatsoever. So we have about, in the local gazetteers, we've identified I think uh, 500 or something like that, so that the modern climatologists are using. But we've also asked what comes before and afterwards, yeah? And how is it really contextualized? And you can see that in, in most of these disasters, you need to have multiple disasters in order to explain that you don't have a harvest. So you have rainfall, then you have a drought, and then you have the seedlings, or you have the seedlings by frost first, because certainly the tree, if there was an early frost, can develop new, new leaves, right? It's not that you kind of like have one disaster and inevitably you don't have a harvest. And you can see that those records are reflecting it. Yeah? They are reflecting it in the local gazetteers that there was a recording practice that was extremely meticulous. And that policy you find in the Yuan dynasty too, based on a Song dynasty record, with a very accurate calendar keeping. Yeah? And with a very accurate idea about when disasters appear. So the climatologists, for instance, take the disasters and say, like, you can see changes in temperature change in the local gazetteers. But actually, about 80% of the data that you find there is recording disasters in the fourth and the seventh months because there is a policy that says you are only allowed to report them in the fourth and the seventh month. Yeah? So, and then you follow that report because all others are not really counting as disaster. If it's in the third month, then the leaf might have actually, uh, the tree might have new leaves, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, and then you can see, I'm sorry, credibility. You can see that local gazetteers, um, uh, editors or compilers, they are aware that theirs is a place of disaster. So in the century afterwards, they go and they look for disasters <laughs> in the earlier period, and then they collect those. So here we have a record of that, and I've shown it to lots of colleagues in, in, who work in the different periods. So in the Tang Dynasty, for instance, there are some particular emperors that had high disaster periods. Then you see specific group, social groups in the north taking those up to make an argument about the recompensation that they want to have 700 years later. So this is actually, I think, a quite interesting repository for us to look at as big data.
and then to go back into the detailed again. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your talk, but, but uh, I'm sorry for, for coming late, right? Um, well, you know, the, the Henry August Rowland was the first president of, of uh, uh, American Physical Society. He wrote a very famous an article um, entitled A Plea for Pew Science, right? Mm -hmm. And in his article, he, he, well, he claimed that uh, Chinese, Chinese for generations had uh, never contributed to, to Pew Science, right? <laughs> I'm not so, uh, so sure whether uh, Henry uh, Warren simply mixed up the terminology Pew Science, Applied Science. Mm -hmm. So can you give a, a comment on Please. Thank you very much. I'm actually not sure if I can comment on that, but I actually would say whatever you call it, they were very interested in values and truth. Yeah, They were interested in creating values and truth and credibility, and that is what you can actually see here. And you can see the Yuan dynasty period are very interested in partly like using numbers for it, but also using very very thoughtful strategies to understand their world that was not, um, that you can't easily explain by saying it was either science or technology or medicine or whatsoever. So I think that's basically the, the basis for that. The discussions that the European history has on this distinction between science, technology, applied sciences, I, don't, I only want to speak for myself. They don't make much sense for what I think one can find when one looks at these developments. They make a lot of sense to understand what we understand and what they understand. It's an important analytic we have, but it's no value judgment, and I don't want to make that. Um, I was quite interested that you, you actually use Google TensorFlow to analyze the data because <laughs> that, is, um, that yeah. is like the cutting edge uh, AI big data tool that people use for analyzing all sorts of modern things but you use it to analyze historical record. But I do wonder whether there's any, any possibility of say um, bias when you're talking about um, because there, there's a possibility that you might be detecting um, area of good record keeping mm -hmm. and, um, and or even literacy um, compared to actually where the farming and the uh, economic farming activity occurs. So mm -hmm. could you like to say something like that uh, mm -hmm. about that? Uh, okay, if I say something about the distinction you be, make between modern and historical data, I'm not sure if I what that distinction should be. Both of them need to be text contextualized so that you know what you're actually seeing. And for that, you know, need to know where the detail comes from and what you want to merge it for in order to see what you want to see, right? So I'm using it actually, or we're using it in this um, in this uh, very difficult literature to understand where we need to read. Yeah? So where the interesting spots are and what we are actually seeing. And if the patterns that we are seeing are the patterns that follow a historiography, for instance, or that follow a, a, a contemporary idea of historiography or something else. So what they, or, or maybe also something uh, um, that was facts or reality to them. And that's why I think the, the, the tool you are using, it doesn't really matter if it's historical data or not. If you're using that tool on modern data and you don't know what you contextualize, that's basically what it is. And I think that actually this historicizing um, uh, in, in, uh, with digital tools is really much, it's developed too much to to represent something and then say that it is. This is not the purpose I'm using it for. I'm using it really in order to go deeper one level. That's, that's what it's interesting for. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. I hope you will join us upstairs to continue the conversation you know, over a glass of wine. But you know, before we do so, uh, please join me in thanking Professor Schaefer for a really splendid lecture. Thank you. Thank you.